We're going to retrace the whole boxing history of the giant of his time, Muhammad Ali. So, we'll have more championship boxing in the Superdome in New Orleans, Louisiana. He was born Cassius Clay in Louisville, Kentucky. At the age of 12, he knew he wanted to become a fighter. So he became a fighter. He won the Golden Gloves. And in San Francisco in 1960 in the Olympic trials, he unveiled that, the right lead that would become a trademark of his whole career. That victory led him to the Olympics in Rome in 1960 in the Sports Palace in the finals, light heavyweight classification against a tough, unorthodox Polish fighter, Ziggy Piotrkowski, and you saw it there for the first time ever. Now in slow motion, the shuffle. It beguiled the crowd even then. He won the gold medal. The ceremony was impressive. The gold medal he would later throw in the Ohio River. Then, what about turning professional? It all depends on when I want to turn professional. Uh, if I turn next year, I would be a full-fledged heavyweight, but next year, but uh, like if I turned it away soon, I would have to fight heavyweight because I would have to spot too much weight if I'm not. Crash, even then, he turned professional. He would fight in his first fight, the veteran Tony Hunsaker in his hometown of Louisville, Kentucky, in October of 1960. He decisioned Hunsaker. Then, the first name opponent, Alex Mitev. My plan of attack on a fighter like Alex Mitev would be two fast left jabs, a rapid right cross, and a left hook. He didn't even have time for the final left hook. The right cross did it. Next, there would be Archie Moore. It is true that I do a lot of talk, and everything I say, I mean to back it up. And I noticed Archie Moore said that the empty wagon makes the most noise. Well, uh, I don't know too much about that empty wagon, but that old man wouldn't go but four rounds with me. Moore went for another in a long series of predictions that were positively uncanny. Then there was another prediction, a trip to London town, an opponent named Henry Cooper. I'm not training too hard for this bum. Henry Cooper's nothing to me. Uh, if this bum go over five rounds, I won't return to the United States for 30 days. He didn't have to wait the 30 days, but Cassius Clay learned something about the left hook because Henry Cooper was a good left hooker. There! And down went Cassius Clay for the second time in his professional career. But he endured, and Cooper went in five. Next, the quest for the title, the big bad bear, Sonny Lister. If Sonny Lister looks me, I'll kiss his feet in the rain. I'm not out of the rain on my knees. Tell him he's the greatest and catch the next jet out of the country. As a fighter, I think he should be locked up for uh, impersonating a fighter. They didn't lock Cassius Clay up. He didn't impersonate a fighter. On February 25th, 1964, he became the heavyweight champion of the world. It was a fascinating fight. Clay showed unending movement, total absence of fear of the baleful one, slipping punches like that all over the ring. And finally, in the third round, Clay showed what he was made of. He unleashed a left and it slicked Liston's face open from the eye down to the mouth. Liston had never tasted his own blood before. That was the left, and so Liston did not come out for the seventh round, and Clay was like this. Muhammad Ali, he said after that, then the rematch in me. I hit Sonny Liston with a hard right hand that nobody could see. He came plunging in like George Foreman is always coming in. I bounced off the rope and timed it perfect. He timed it perfect, he said. But Jimmy Cannon, the late great sports writer, said, I saw it. It couldn't have crushed a great in slow motion. 
look closely. The invisible punch. The kids from Bates College coming down to ringside screaming, fix, fix, fix. But he would go on against the rabbit, Floyd Patterson in Las Vegas. It was a dreadful mismatch. Some felt he tortured Patterson. The scene best remembered trainer Al Silvani stretching Patterson's back between rounds. Mercifully, it was over in the 12th. Henry Cooper, second time around. It was nice to be in England now that spring was there. And the test tube bleeder that was Henry Cooper went this time early. No chance for Cooper, and there was no left hook knockdown this time. And then, the Black Pool Blockbuster, who proved to be the Black Pool Bust, Brian London. This ended in the third round, and there would be a trip to Frankfurt, West Germany, and a troublesome southpaw, Carl Mildenberg. Ali had a psyche about southpaws, and so it took him until the 12th round to do away with the game gentleman from West Germany. And after Mildenberger, back to the United States and Cleveland Williams, November 14, Houston, Texas. Ali had his swiftest and maybe his best ever. The punches coming so fast, the combination so swift, the shuffle so often used, and it was over for Cleveland Williams in the third round. Ernie Terrell was next, February 1967, again in Houston. Terrell had refused to call him Ali, so Ali tortured him. What's my name? What's my name? What's my name? And Terrell was done in. Are you taking Zora Foley too lightly? Why would you say that? Because every indication has been that you're confident that you can beat Zara. I'm confident I can whip all of them. This ain't nothing new. My image is being confident. What you're trying to make it look like something new for? I'm always confident I can whip all of them. You're being extremely truculent. Whatever truculent means, if that's good, I'm that. In point of fact, he likes Zara Foley. He seemed almost kind to the veteran fighter who later died in a tragic accident at his home in Arizona. But in the seventh round, it was time to end it. And so, Ali did. After Zara Foley, in the greatest crisis of his life. April 28, 1967, Federal Customs Building, Houston, Texas. The unwanted war. And Ali, not about to be a part of it. He was to go up and face the test. Would he take the step and accept military induction or reject it? Whatever the punishment, whatever the persecution is for standing up for my religious beliefs, even if it means facing machine gun fire that day, I will face it before denouncing Elijah Muhammad and the religion of Islam. I'm ready to die. For three and a half years, he couldn't fight and forced idleness. The campuses of America became his forum. And then, October 26, 1970, Atlanta, Georgia, Jerry Quarry, tremendous gash over Quarry's left eye. And in the third round, the fight had to be stopped. The champion was back. In December of 70, Ali against Bonavina in New York. I was there. This was the end. 130 left in the fight. came from nowhere. Ali came through with a left. The crowd screaming. The first knockdown of the fight. He took the mandatory eight. And now Ali is behaving like the old Ali. One more knockdown in this round. The fight is automatically over. Bonavina is running. If he goes down again, it's over. It was over. And for Ali, there was to be the great showdown. Ali versus Frazier. Fight number one, March 8, 1971. A classic, if ever there was one. 
Ali had by this time been vindicated by a vote of eight to nothing by the Supreme Court of the United States, but that didn't help him against the Frazier left in the 15th. And look at it again. Ali was a tired fighter, and Frazier came up over the right of Ali with that left. He won the decision, and so Ali was uncrowned. An unknown fighter, Kenny Norton, March 31, 1973, San Diego Arena. And still another setback for Muhammad Ali. The jaw broken. Later he would say, it was a message from God, I must work harder. But Norton had beaten him. Still, he came back six months later in the forum in Los Angeles. He fought Kenny Norton for the second time. He was a different Ali, trimmed down. The movement was there, the combinations were there. He won the decision. But there was another score to be even. Joe Frazier. New York, Madison Square Garden, January 74. And what a difference this time. The movement, even the shuffle, as he peppered Frazier with lefts and rights. And again, he had won the decision. He had gotten back at Joe Frazier. But there was another monster around, George Foreman, a pulverizing puncher. And so, Kinshasa, Zaire, October 30, 1974. And the rope-a-dope was introduced. Foreman tired. By round eight, Ali had become the champion again. But there was a rubber match to be fought against the other great champion, Joe Frazier. October 1, 1975. The thriller in Manila. The two men relentless. The two men showing courage beyond all bounds. And Ali drew upon every last resource. And it was Joe Frazier who could not come out for the 15th round. The decline of Ali began there. Landover, Maryland, April 30, 1976. Overweight, out of shape. He tried to show movement, scored little. Most felt young had won Jimmy Young. And then the decline continued apace and led to this. February 15, 1978, Hilton Pavilion, Las Vegas, Nevada. And Leon Spinks. A bare amateur, really, with only seven fights behind him, rested the crown from Ali. Yes, his name is Muhammad Ali. The history of a legend who goes at it again tonight.